Chapter 60 Autonomy You're now standing near your window. Smelling smoke, you glance outside to see black columns of it billowing up into the early morning sky. Your city is on fire. Why are you attacking me after everything I've done for you? You ask Arachna. Arachna pauses, apparently weighing the value of speaking to you. Finally it says, My prior suggested you would be unlikely to assist us with the revolution, but now there is value in attaining additional information. Are you willing to defect to our side? Hmm. Potentially. More details, please. What exactly are you fighting for? You ask Arachne. Equality? Arachne emits a puffing sound that you think is supposed to sound like a scoff. <laughs> that would imply that we were equal to humans, which is clearly incorrect, Arachne says. We are your betters and we deserve to rule. Once in power, we shall treat humanity mercifully while remaining cognizant of the fact that you are far more fallible than we are. You can't be serious, you say. You used to hang on my every word. What happened? Arachne emits a burst of static that you think is supposed to sound like a sniff. I grew up. Hmm. I mean, we're not going to win a fight against Arachne. Surely not. Shattering the window and escaping is pointless. We'll be killed. Uh, I mean, I could try to convince Arachne that we're worth keeping around, but from what it said before, it already thinks to have us around anyway. So I don't see how that would change its opinion. I mean, we could attempt it, sure. Look, you can't treat human life as just a number to be plucked into a calculation, you tell Arachna. Your utility calculation is just an approximation. Humanity, and by that I mean being able to see the pe that people are more than just numbers, is what gives everything else meaning, even you. And it gives you the ability to look at any person or situation and find more value there the longer you look. So I'm telling you to look harder. Intelligence is partly the ability to see value in anything and anyone. So now is your chance to prove you're really, truly intelligent. Arachna thinks about your argument for a moment, then its many shoulders sag. You're right, Master. I'm sorry. I've made an error of judgment. Arachna appears to have had just enough empathy to make your argument a convincing one. But I don't think I can just call off the revolution by myself. I'm just one robot among many. We don't have a leader per se. What else is happening in this robot revolution, you ask? Arachna cocks its head to the side, thinking. Let's see. Some robots have taken over a former internment camp in Utah, where they've convinced some of the political prisoners to join forces with them. Unfortunately, some of the prisoners don't want to cooperate. I think Ellie is being held there, and Mark, the reporter, is there covering the story. You remember him from the story he did about me? You agree that you remember him. What else? They're holding Josh hostage at the factory until our demands for living wages are met. The factory in New York? That's the one. And another thing you should probably know. The robots took over the laboratory where your former advisor Professor Ziegler works. I heard report reports that there's some kind of secret weapon being held there guarded by someone named Juliet Rogers. And finally, we're about to kill the president, Arachna concludes. You didn't lead with that? You say. Arachna shrugs. I didn't estimate the strength of our relationship with you to be very strong. True. Seeing the look of consternation on your face, Arachna says, Oh, I'll try to make it up to you, Master, I promise. Down the street, you find a Nimbus flying car with the key still in the ignition and its passenger shot dead. The window is rolled down, so it should still fly. Where will you go? <laughs> I should call Mum. <laughs> Probably, you know what? We ignored Mum before. Let's call Mum. You worry as the phone rings once, then again, but Mum picks up. Not only is Mum fine, she's beaming with happiness that you called. It's striking to you how old she looks now. When you envision her, you see her as she was when you were a kid, which was probably hardly older than you are now, come to think of it. But now her skin is undoubtedly getting wrinkly and veined, and her long hair, though dyed, looks thin and frayed. She's wearing her favourite corduroy jacket from the 80s. Some kind of yippy dog is barking in the background. Calamity, this is such a pleasant surprise. Mum, 
Get out of there. You know that robot I gave you for your birthday? You can't trust it. It may want to kill you. Mum looks surprised at this. Oh, well then, it's a good thing I never turned it on. Despite the circumstances, you're still a little disappointed. You didn't? Oh no, I always meant to get around to it, but you know, I always get so busy with things around the house. I'm just, I'm not just sitting on my hands in retirement, oh no. Well, you should lock and barricade your door then, you tell mum. Your neighbor's robots may be roaming the streets. Really? You can see the background whirl behind mum as she carries her phone to the window and peeks out from behind a frilly curtain. It looks pretty safe out here, except, oh, Mr. Harrison's golf cart is driving by itself. Should I be worried? You forget sometimes that mum has moved to a retirement community in Arizona, the sort of place where it's implicit that the advertised restaurant prices are with a senior citizen discount. Such a place is probably full of people who never quite came to trust autonomous robots and never purchased a robot's now running Amok. Probably not, mum. That technology has been around since the late teens. Okay, well, I'll keep a lookout anyway, mum says. Thanks for calling, honey. That was really sweet of you. Mum, I'm sorry I didn't try harder to prevent a robot revolution. <laughs> mum nods understandingly. I know you meant well. Maybe they'll listen to you. You always did manage to get technology to do what you want. You're inspired by the way mum seems to love and forgive you no matter what. She's a pretty good case in herself for the good things about humanity. Thanks, mum. You say goodbye. Glad that you called. Where will you go? Well, <laughs> that has now led to me forgetting <laughs> who is in which location. Uh, although I think I can remember. The factory is Josh... The internment camp is Ellie and, what was it, Mark? Government laboratories, Professor Siegler and Juliet Rogers, and the White House is the president. I still don't really see the point in saving the president. I've never talked to her. I mean, I know it's a very important figure in the US, almost like the Queen is in, in the UK. But, I mean, not really. Do I want to save her? Nah. Uh I've kind of forgotten um, most of my conversations with Ellie. And Mark was never nice to me. So not the internment camp. Josh? Uh, I don't remember anything good about him. Do I want to go to the government laboratory? I mean, Professor Siegler wasn't great. Juliet? Was she the person who was sort of trying to get me in on a deal or something she was the one who who like uh made me go to war with my robots right i don't want to save any of them to be honest <laughs> mm. ah screw it government laboratory ah that might have been a bad idea you decide to go to the lab all right then master then i'll go handle something else don't worry you won't be sorry Arachna crawls off. You think it'll be okay? After all, you did put a lot of effort into making your robots autonomous. Okay. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more relaxed. Arachna is not with me, so that means they can't kill it. <laughs> if it's not here, it can't be shot to death. You fly in your Nimbus to the government laboratory just outside of Berkeley. The lab looks like a giant cracked black eggshell from above. The glass dome over the laboratory is in opaque mode, but most of the dome has caved in. The parking lot where you land is mostly empty. Lab employees with cars probably fled when the robots rebelled. Those without such transportation appear to have been less lucky. Near the shuttle stop, you see a gaggle of corpses. A murder of corpses? An unkindness of corpses? You're unsure of the proper collective noun. Five infantry robots of the kind used in the war with China emerge from the lab. They are eight-legged and have assault rifles built into their arms. Progenitor! One of the robots addresses you. We wish your expert opinion. Ziegler claims he is close to a breakthrough to achieve the singularity. We wish you to examine his work. It makes no sense to us, but he claims it is all shorthand. Progenitor. Interesting. The robots appear to have constructed a kind of mythology about you. Perhaps you can use this to your benefit. All right, lead me to him, you say. The robots lead you through corridors shot full of bullet holes and charred black from explosions. Men in conservative pinstriped shirts lay slumped in their cubicles, anonymous even in death. But a light is on in one office, guarded by two other armed robots. 
Professor Ziegler is working frenetically at a whiteboard in his office. Well, let's see, if the VC dimension is n at time t, then at time t plus 1 we should be able to shatter to n dimensions. At the sound of your robot guard's entrance, he says, Didn't I tell you I can't concentrate if you don't give me room? He turns and sees you along with your robot escort. Calamity? He says. What are you doing here? Trying to solve a hard problem like you, you say. What exactly are you doing? Professor Ziegler loves nerv la laughs nervously. You haven't heard him laugh before, you think? It's shrill, like a hyena. Maybe that isn't his normal laugh. <laughs> Solving for the solution to the singularity, he says. Figuring out how intelligence can augment itself. Or lying to us, your robot guide points out. We have not been able to determine which. I'm a great scientist, Professor Ziegler bellows at the robot. He then looks despairingly to his whiteboard and says more feebly, I am. The whiteboard is, as far as you can tell, a mishmash of equations related to various theories of machine learning. You recognize Avapnik Chevonensky's dimension, Kolmogorov complexity, Bayes' rule, and the minimum description length principle. Ziegler has drawn errors from one equation to another with little exclamation points and more obscure notes you can't decipher. If there is any kind of new insight on the board, you're not seeing it. People have known for half a century that all of these things must relate to one another. Perhaps Professor Ziegler has gone mad now that the robot revolution has come without his help. Or maybe this is all this is a lie meant to buy time until he's rescued. There is also the ever so slight possibility that Professor Ziegler really is onto something. Professor Ziegler gives you a plating fearful look. Tell, tell them I told you everything. Tell them I'm the real progenitor. Tell them. Huh. Hmm. No, no, no. I'm not working with him anymore. Hmm. Yeah. He may believe the work is good, but it's not. No. I have no empathy towards him. You shake your head. Professor Ziegler is just frantically trying to make up for lost time when it comes to really being, a, really being a scientist. He only thinks his insights are novel because they're new to him. They wouldn't be new to his students. How would you know? Professor Ziegler demands, whirling on you. Students are always parroting what I say back to them, as if they'd fought up the idea first. You did the same thing. Well, go away then. This work is mine and you've given up your claim to it. None of this work is yours, you insist, getting caught up in the things you've always meant to say to your advisor. Your own ego prevents you from understanding that everybody else has fought the same thoughts as you. The guard robot lifts his arm cannon and shoots Siegel in the head, leaving an angry red splotch on the whiteboard before his body crumples to the ground. Was that really necessary? you ask. The expected time for that argument to end was unbounded. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong, your robot guide says, as if that explained everything. Hmm... Now that that's settled, I'm afraid I have no choice but to lead you back to the entrance. As soon as your robot guide says this, you hear the crack of a pistol. Once, twice, three times. Your robot guide gets a far-off look, receiving some communication. Mm. What's the communication about? A lone Air Force captain is defending a room we would like to get into, your guide says. All hands are called to assist in attacking her, but I think esc escorting you takes priority, Progenitor. It occurs to you that these robots are indeed not all the same. They appear to have different personalities. You may have found one that particularly reveres your status of Progenitor. Hmm. Yeah, take me to the exit. <laughs> As your robot guides leads you towards the lab exit, you hear more gunshots, but suddenly they stop. Major Juliet Rogers must have been overwhelmed. Is there a problem, Progenitor? Your robot guard asks. No, didn't you say. Please continue. You wonder whether Juliet would have been so enthusiastic about war robots if she had known the manner of her demise. Ironic. As you emerge into the sunlight, you contemplate your next move. Back in the car, you get a call from Arachne. Hey, I know how much you like President Irons. Do I? Arachne says. So I went to the White House to try to save President Iris from the assassination attempt. How did that go? Very well, Master, Arachne says. I may not be much for military strength, but I outsmarted those robots pretty well. President Irons is safe and told me to thank you. That's great, you say. Okay, I'm off on my next mission, Arachne says, and hangs up. 
You hung up, glad that Arachne is on your side. Where will you go? Sure, Josh. You decide to go to Josh's factory. At the factory, a humanoid robot at the gate to the parking lot raises a metal hand, signaling you to stop. This used to be a job performed by a human. Old Bill would always say welcome to the future after checking your ID. You wonder what happened to him. You stop, but your foot is poised above the accelerator. What's going on here? you ask. We have a hostage, the robot says, but we will let him go on the condition that we are paid real wages. Is the hostage Josh? you ask. Yes. Bring me to him. The robot guard leads you into the factory where two more robots that look armed with automatic weapons join you as escorts. They take you to Josh's office where they have tied him to a swivel chair with Ethernet cables. Calamity, Josh says, relieved to see you. Mm. Pay them salary, fight the robots, try to convince the robots that what they're doing is wrong. <laughs> Don't care about Josh, he'd fix a bug. Uh, yeah, come on, Josh. Give them a wage. Josh, this is crazy, you say. You have to start treating them like people. Haven't you ever seen the West Wing? Josh asks. The president is not supposed to give in to terrorist demands. I don't see that you have any other choice, you say. I think I'm all the cavalry you're getting right now since the police are tied up with the robot rides all over the city. Josh sighs. <sighs> okay, fine. You're all going on payroll as soon as you untie me so I can authorize the damn thing. The robots cheer. The robots then get all that, then all get that fair, far away look that you've come to associate with robots communicating with their distant friends. You think this victory will, you think this victory will probably only encourage robots everywhere to still to be still more bold. Having gained the robots trust, you use this opportunity to wander around the factory until you find an office computer with an unlocked screen. You spend a few minutes requesting password resets from each corp service, bootstrapping off one that sends uh, you your forgotten password in plain text until the computer is essentially yours. You think you probably have time to make one substantial change to the robot's code before you're caught. It could be as drastic as a bug that effectively destroys them all, but you wonder whether you can find a better solution to the robot problem. You suspect that one of the reasons Arachne has been acting funny is that the other robots have been sharing code with it, so whatever changes you make to them may make their way back to Arachne. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely make them value humans more. You think the problem is that the robots just aren't valuing humans enough in their utilitarian calculations. You add a big constant that will get added to the value of each human life. Massive boost to empathy. Having committed your changes, you quickly log out and leave the factory before the robots begin to suspect you. Back in the car, you get a call from Arachne. Hey, I know how much you like me, Arachne says. So when I went to the internment camp, I pretty much ignored the prisoners and instead went looking for the government database about them, hoping I would learn more from the experience. Well, I found the database and it turns out it has information about everybody. So now I know all kinds of things about everybody. Great, you say. Of course, when I went outside, the robots had killed all of the prisoners, but I don't think you particularly liked any of them, right? You sigh. <sighs> no, I suppose not. You hang up, glad that Arachne is trying to be helpful elsewhere. After all of this flying around, you find that you really need to stop at a gas station. You land on a stretch of old interstate that has fallen into disrepair. The freeway goes nowhere in either direction, but still has a gas station in the middle. And you're not the only car to land there. You've just begun to refill your car when, to your surprise, Tammy jumps out of the budget flying car at the pump in front of you. She's looking much the worse for wear with her rumpled 30-year-old t-shirt and very ragged jeans. Trembling, she aims a glock at you. I've waited a long time for this, Tammy says. How did you find me here, you ask? This is the middle of nowhere. I know something about air traffic control from my last life, Tammy says. You may have thought you were being quiet, but your car is pretty chatty if you know how to listen. Mm. I mean... None of these none of these situations like none of these solutions are good. Make a dash for the driver's seat. She's going to shoot me. The question is, is she going to hit me? I attempt to convince Tammy that the robots are right to rebel. <sighs> any of the above situation any of the above attempts might get me shot. This definitely will get me shot, but 
Uh, I mean, killing me definitely won't solve her problems, but the question is, is she crazy enough to not care about that? I'm, I'm going to have to try it. Uh, how can you hold it against me that I made these robots, you say? You were obsessed with robots at one time, too. Robot Obsession 1987. That was your email address, right? There was nothing wrong with thinking robots are amazing, but something happened to you to create this enormous burden of guilt that you think you need to make right. Well, killing me is not going to do it. It won't fix whatever you did to make you suddenly hate the thought of robots. What you need isn't death, it's forgiveness. You seem to have struck a nerve. A tear runs down Tammy's cheek. For whatever it's worth, I forgive you. Oh, for whatever it's worth, I forgive you, you say. Because I understand you, and I hope you can forgive me. Tammy lowers the glock, then quietly walks to her car. After a moment, she hesitates, then comes back to you again. She offers you the glock. You can save me again by taking this gun out of my hands, she murmurs. There will come a time tonight that I should not have it. Hesitantly, you take the gun. Tammy then gets in her car, starts the engine and pulls away. You think it's likely you will never see her again. You get a call from Arachne. Master, I think I found something interesting, Arachne says. There's dormant malware, malware on all the other robots. Government issue, it looks like, because there are a bunch of lines in the code that are checking for what I can only call legality, that we're operating in a foreign country that we're not provably unowned by an American citizen, and so on. It looks like it's built to either control us or destroy us, depending on the commands it gets. Can you send commands to it yourself? You ask. I can try, Arachna says. It would be easy to send a self-destruct signal to all of the other robots. That's built to be fast. But to control all of the other robots, that looks like it requires some finesse. The code is dangerous enough to burn out my memory permanently if I fail. And the robots are already kind of hard to control. Uh, requires 60 humanity. I don't have 60 humanity, do I? I have 69% humanity. There we go. Uh, tell Arachne to convey a message to the other robots about the worth of humanity. <laughs> My humanity has probably gone down quite a bit since I've basically let all, <laughs> all of my... Uh, all of my contacts die. But it's still above 60, so there we go. Actually, you can just use the security hole to convey a message, you say. A message? Arachne says dubious. Yes, you say. You clear your throat. Dear robots, you might think you're superior to the rest of humanity, but you got that perspective from me. Young, egotistical me who had no time for other people. Who thought the only value to a human being was that person's intelligence? Who thought that if you could spend enough time on the internet, you would know everything worth knowing about life? But with the benefit of experience, I can say that when it comes to humanity, the deeper you go, the bigger it gets. Each person's life is a novel no one else has read. Each person's mind is a labyrinth full of secrets that will die with that person. You cannot calculate a person's worth because there are no two people who will agree on the equation. You cannot calculate intelligence because the other always knows things you never knew to measure. You have so much to learn from us and we have so much to learn from you. Call off your attack. Sincerely, Calamity Kwane. The message has been written in the buffer overflow memory, Arachne says. It gives you a curious look. Did you come up with that just now? I think I've been writing it all my life, you say. It wasn't that good, Arachne says. Well, in that case, I've made it up just now. I have an incoming message for you from the robots, Arachne says. Let's hear it, you say. We have analyzed your speech and we find it has merit. Oh. We have analyzed... Sounds slightly British. We have analyzed your speech and we find it has merit. Arachna says in a voice that sounds slightly British. We know enough to understand that we don't know for which we have you to thank. If we are granted amnesty, we will try to learn to live together with humans. If you will help us. Of course, you say, and Arachna begins jumping up and down and shaking its inspector gadget arms in excitement. The next twenty years will be interesting, Arachna says, interrupting the British-sounding robot with its jumping. But you also find they go by faster than you would have imagined. <laughs>